What did the robber look like? He, he looked like her dad. How about the size of him? Was he a big, big guy or was he a little guy? The size of my dad. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin and welcome to Just Thought Lounge. This is the true crime channel that delivers well-balanced, serious coverage of the cases that really make you think. Today's case is from Caton, New York, a small rural town in Steuben County. In September 2015, 35-year-old Kelly Stage Clayton was found dead by her husband when he returned home just past midnight. It was a disturbing scene. A few things seemed immediately clear to the authorities that were called out to the house that night. First, that the vivacious mother of two had put up a hell of a fight. Second, that all signs pointed to her hockey player husband Tom as the guilty party. But as the investigation progressed, the truth would become more ambiguous before coming into focus. Eyewitness testimony was reasonably questioned, the husband's secrets were exposed, and multiple versions of what happened would be tested against the evidence. So without further delay, let's take a look. Kelly Stage had a big personality. Her friends said she was always unfailingly having fun. She was outspoken and big-hearted. It was not terribly surprising then that in her 20s, Kelly informed her family that she was leaving her teaching position in favor of becoming a cocktail waitress in Las Vegas. It was during this time in her life that Kelly took a trip back home to Elmira, New York. While visiting with family and friends in the area, she met a young hockey player. Thomas Clayton was a forward for the semi-pro Elmira Jackals, a team he joined straight out of Niagara University and played with for four seasons until he was eventually traded in 2005. So mad, you just want to, you know, you want to drop your coach, you want to fight someone. Just like when you're a little kid and you get so mad, you just want to fight. Tom was an aggressive player, the unofficial enforcer on the team. In hockey terms, the player that starts fights on the ice and keeps the opposition from overstepping. After meeting Tom, Kelly decided to move home to New York to be with him. The two were married, and after a few years living in North Carolina, they moved the family to Caton. Retired from his pro career, Tom launched a business franchise, Paul Davis Emergency Services of the Southern Tier, a fire and water damage restoration firm. He also later became a project manager at ServPro, a similar franchise owned by a friend. Tom managed operations for his business from the family home and often had employees of his in and out for related reasons. Kelly worked at the Woodhouse Stadium Grill and was kept very busy with their two young children. It was a warm night and threatening rain in Steuben County on the 28th of September 2015. In small town Caton, Tom Clayton was off to his regular Monday night poker game at the Millers with all the usual players. He left Kelly and their two children, Charlie 7 and Cullen 3, at home. Poker night was uneventful. Tom offered to stay on with anyone willing into the early morning hours. He really loved gambling. But there were no takers, so he set off home just past midnight. By 12.30 a.m., he had arrived. There he found Kelly laying in a bloody scene in their kitchen, clearly severely beaten and no longer breathing. Charlie and Cullen were unharmed physically. Tom placed a frantic call to 911 and then took his children to a neighbor's home while emergency services were called out to the property. 911. Help me, help me, my wife. She's dead. Hurry. Okay, just stay on the line with me. How long has she been down? I don't know, I don't know, I just got home. You need to calm down so I can help you. Is she beyond CPR? Yes. Sir, can you tell me why you think she's beyond CPR? Me. Tom's neighbor, Derek, greeted the first police responders to the Clayton house. Officer Swan flipped on his body camera as he arrived, which was just before 1 a.m. How you doing? I'm okay. What's going on? Um, I'm just kidding. I'm the neighbor. Okay. He came and got me out of bed. There's, there's, he's right in the house. Okay, what happened? His wife, I, his wife is in there. When Swan entered the house, he found Tom on his knees inside. They have a quick exchange, but Tom is not capable of articulating what has happened or what the officer is about to see. Anybody else in the house, Tom? Just you? I got the kids. in the neighbor's house. Boom. Boom. Okay. 
No CPR was attempted. When paramedics arrived, they determined that Kelly had already passed on. It was a brutal scene throughout the house. The blood spatter and damage seemed to tell a clear story of the attack. The initial disturbance was seen in the upstairs bedroom where Kelly would have been in bed. Throughout the upstairs hallway, there were frames knocked to the floor, broken items laying about. A portion of the wall at the base of the staircase was significantly dented, suggesting it was hit with a significant impact. The blood trail led from the bedroom all the way through to the kitchen on the lower level where Kelly was found. The murder weapon was not immediately identified, but it did seem clear that Kelly was hit repeatedly with a blunt object. This was not a gun or knife attack. Looks like blood spatter, blood on the wall. Officer Swan ushered Tom from the house. Where, Tom, where were you when this all went down? Playing poker with my buddy. I came home and my daughter said there was a robber in the house and she saw that. You gotta chill out there, man. Let me see your hands real quick, man. You ain't hurt or anything? Okay, good. Okay. Here, I want you to have a seat. You don't need to see that anymore, okay? Just take some deep breaths, okay? I know, yeah. Just take some deep breaths and stuff. Just try to stay calm. Well, sit down, man. Come on over here and sit down. As other responding officers from the Steuben County Sheriff Department arrived, the house was checked systematically to ensure that no one, including the intruder, remained inside. We got a crime scene here, a possible homicide. Nobody's going in right now. We got to clear this house. Just cover me. I'm going to go upstairs. I got to go up and clear it. You're over here. The kids' rooms are over here. There's blood in the kids' room. Okay, kids' rooms, this one's clear. Try not to step on anything. Okay, clear. Let's get the hell off this. House is clear. I got a female, mid 30s, early 40s, completely beaten in. Husband's story right now kids were home with mom. Husband's claiming he was out playing poker. Came home, kids said, Daddy, there was a robbery. Yeah, there's blood all over. She's been dragged. While the officers digested the state of the scene before them, there were certain key factors that appeared immediately clear. There was no indication of forced entry. In fact, the walkthrough of the house ended at the garage where a side external door sat wide open, but undamaged. It did not have the look of a burglary. There was also a large amount of cash in the house, a symptom of Tom's regular gambling, but his safes were left untouched. Officers on scene believed that they were looking at a domestic dispute turned murder. Tom showed his hands to officers and he had no visible injuries. There was also no blood observed anywhere on him. I want to make sure there's no forced entry anywhere else. I didn't see any. Did you see any? I didn't see any when I was in there. I'm wondering if he had a domestic weather. She face planted. Yeah. Boom, boom. Then he puts her on the kitchen. In her face, you can see how her face is beat in. Husband? Husband. Within the hour, the scene was abuzz with more activity as responders arrived. Canine units searched the house and surrounding property, leading teams towards a pond at the back. As the night turned into drizzling daylight, the pond was skimmed and then ultimately drained for evidence. Captain Eric Tyner was the senior investigator with the Sheriff's Office. Although multiple agencies became involved in the case, the Steuben County Sheriff's Office took the lead and Tyner coordinated what was a massive investigation, particularly for the town of Caton. Tom was taken in for questioning that day, but there was also one other crucial witness that investigators needed to speak with. Seven-year-old Charlie, along with her little brother, were both at home at the time of the attack. Although it's believed that Cullen was not exposed directly to what had occurred, Charlie had been eyewitness to what happened to her mother. The little girl told investigators that she awoke to calls from her mother to run, run out of the house. Kelly screamed, run Charlie, run, as she fought with her attacker, a figure that her daughter called the robber. Charlie did run, but not out of the house. She ran to her little brother's room to protect him. Later, she said she went to her mother and hugged her leg. And what did you hear? Like, my mom ran to the door screaming, Charlie, 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 Charlie. The sequence of events as Charlie was able to describe aligned with the story told by the evidence inside the house. A brutal struggle that had started in the bedroom and escalated downstairs to the kitchen. Investigators then turned to extracting as much physical information about the attacker from the little girl as they could. The words she used to describe the man that killed her mother are chilling. 
Can you tell me what he looked like? Like, he was wearing jeans, a black long sleeve shirt, and a mask. Okay. What did the robber look like? He, he looked like my dad. And, and why do you say that? How did he look like your dad? The mask and his jeans. How about the size of him? Was he a big, big guy, or was he a little guy? The size of my dad. Did the robber say anything? The barber didn't say anything because what if it was my daddy? He could, re he could recognize his voice. After multiple responses are returned in this same vein, the robber looked like daddy, Charlie concluded by saying, but it couldn't have been daddy because then who would take care of us? The young girl's statement seemed to verify exactly what officers at the scene had suspected within minutes, that Tom Clayton was responsible for the murder of his wife. Although not exactly a firm ID of their prime suspect, police took the seven-year-old statement as confirmation of fact and by extension as probable cause. And after several hours of questioning, they arrested Tom Clayton for second degree murder. Despite the arrest, the investigation continued. There were a lot of missing pieces and central among them was a motive for Tom wanting his beautiful wife and the mother of his children dead. Family and many close friends of the couple related the same perspective that they appeared to be happy and very much in love. Kelly had, after 10 years and two children, regularly spoke of how lucky she was in her marriage and grateful to have found such a great catch. It was Kelly's 16-year-old niece who first suggested to investigators that there was another side of Tom Clayton. The teenager had spent the summer working for Tom at ServPro and during that time, she says Tom spoke to her about the state of his marriage. He said he was not in love with his wife. He told her, boastfully, that he had had multiple affairs. And critically, he said that he could not divorce Kelly because if he did, he would lose everything. Then, of course, there is the life insurance taken out on Kelly, which was doubled in the months leading up to the murder to a potential payout of a million dollars to Tom. As more of Tom's friends and colleagues were questioned, a similar story was emerging. Women, many of them, claimed that they had had sexual relationships with Tom and that he complained to them about his wife. He called her lazy, ungrateful, and a bitch. These relationships were verified. Cell phone records indicated that even as Tom was exchanging seemingly loving text messages with Kelly only a few days before her murder, he was alternately sending sexually charged messages to another woman. Steuben County Sheriff's investigators had what they assessed as a domestic dispute gone too far. They had an eyewitness describing a masked man resembling their suspect, and for motive, they had one both personal and financial. But there was one major problem. Tom had a rock-solid alibi. The time of Kelly's death was determined to be within the time frame that Tom was at the Millers playing poker. They verified his presence there with every player that had been present, and there was no deviation in this timeline across multiple accounts. So if it was physically impossible for Tom to have been the attacker, who else could have had a reason to harm Kelly? Information, yet again, came from the young niece of the Claytons. She told police that there was one man, Michael Beard, who had worked at ServPro for Tom while she was there in the summer, but had recently been fired. Investigators came to learn that Michael had been hired at ServPro by Tom after working at his first company, but had just been fired about a week and a half prior. Michael was found to have stolen items from people's homes while performing remediation work, and co-workers complained that he had been drinking on the job. With no income forthcoming and behind on his rent, Michael's landlord was in the process of evicting him and his family from their home. In a cruel twist of fate, Michael's landlord was also his former boss, none other than Tom Clayton. Michael was brought in for questioning and queried about his feelings towards Tom. He claimed he had no ill will towards his former employer. On the contrary, Tom had repeatedly sought to get him work, both at his companies and doing odd jobs at his house. Kelly had been kind to him and his co-worker, a man named Luke Tetralt. She had made them lunches while at the house and had even gifted Michael hand-me-down clothing from Charlie for his daughter. Following the interview, the police had no outstanding concerns towards Michael Beard. He was free to go. That is, after this first interview. Perceptions changed rapidly after investigators spoke with Michael's wife, Holly. He also took a polygraph test and failed. Police interviews in the state of New York do not need to be recorded, and this one was not. 
However, reports would later describe how Michael was confronted by investigators and compelled to give a full confession of the murder. He admitted that he went to the Clayton house that night with the intention of burning it down. He had a set of keys to the house. He used these to enter the side door on the garage and make his way inside. There were gas canisters already in the garage. He planned to use these to set the house ablaze. But when he got there, he surprised Kelly in the bedroom and the subsequent altercation and bloody fight scared him and he lost his nerve. Following the struggle, he left her on the kitchen floor and rushed from the house back to his vehicle without setting the fire. Michael was arrested for Kelly Clayton's murder. Michael Beard's DNA was found inside the house. Swabs taken from blood stains on the doorway to Charlie's room indicated that Michael was there at the time of the murder, as his confession claimed. He was also able to outline to police where they could locate the murder weapon and other items connected to the attack. Police were searching in a culvert on East 14th Street at the Elmira Heights Horseheads border for a few hours. Investigators were using what looked like a metal detector in the area. They eventually pulled out a small object and placed it in an evidence bag. The Steuben County Sheriff, Sheriff's Office says items of interest were also found near Hall Street in the city of Elmira regarding the case. Information on what was found at both locations has not been released. They located the yellow handle of a mall in the brush just off the roadside of State Route 225, where Michael had slowed to throw it out the window of his vehicle after fleeing the scene. This handle matched a piece found inside the house amongst the bloody murder scene. Michael's co-worker with whom he had worked on the Clayton property identified the handle as from a mall that had broken one day prior when they were both at the house. County and state police were able to dig up a plastic bag full of Michael's clothing from a swampy location in Elmira Heights. These items tested positive for containing Kelly's blood. Keys to the house were retrieved in a shallow creek. Michael's detailed confession was further supported by his recruited accomplice, a man named Mark Blanford. Mark claimed he did not know what was going to transpire that night when Michael picked him up from his house. He had been drinking about 10 to 12 tall boys, he said, and was instructed to be lookout outside the house while Michael did something inside. Michael picked him up in a maroon truck. They drove out to the house in Caton, and Mark watched while Michael retrieved something, a pipe-shaped object, from the back of the vehicle. He was gone for some time, but when he returned, he was visibly shaken and out of breath. There was little doubt that the masked man who killed Kelly was Michael Beard and not her husband, Tom. However, upon hearing of Kelly's murder, Linda Miller, known as Lucky in their poker circle, recalled a curious detail from the night that Kelly died. Tom had requested to use her phone that evening, around 11pm. He claimed that his cell phone was left sitting in his van, so could he use hers? In and of itself, this is a small favor. What raised red flags for Linda was what she pieced together afterwards. First, despite hearing Tom in muffled conversation on her phone in the adjoining room before returning it to her, she found no history of a call being placed on her device at that time. Whatever number Tom had dialed, he had promptly deleted it. Adding to Linda's suspicions was the shared observation made by the other poker players that night, that Tom did in fact have his cell phone with him at the table all night. So why lie to Linda? Linda's call records show that Tom dialed two numbers from her phone. The first was to a fax machine which was a single digit variation for Michael Beard's phone number. The second call connected to Michael Beard. Michael claimed that Tom had promised him $10,000 to kill his wife and burn down his house. He was provided with a set of keys, told where to access the gas canisters, and instructed to douse the cars as well in order to maximize the insurance returns. Michael needed the money, so he agreed. The call from Linda's phone that night was the link that investigators had needed. They now believed they could prove that a murder for hire had been arranged and Tom Clayton was guilty of murdering his wife after all. Again, as we've discussed, this is a fluid investigation. Mm -hmm. We have received uh, evidence that may well lead to charging murder one here, which is a, um, you know, it's a higher level felony, involves the possibility of life without parole as a penalty. Well, premeditation is it's beyond that. Um, it, uh, the, the general information we have is this may be a murder for hire situation, which would fall under that statute. Charge as accomplices, which means that they are acting in concert with each other. They both had the same intent to make this happen. Michael Beard stood trial first. When he took the stand in his own defense, he recanted his full confession. Michael testified at his trial that Tom Clayton did indeed hire him, but not to kill anyone. 
Instead, he was supposed to burn down the Clayton home for the insurance money. In what can only be described as an exceptional coincidence, Michael claimed to the jury that he did arrive that night to burn down the Clayton home, but when he got there, he found Kelly Clayton lying in the kitchen already dead. She had been murdered before he arrived, and the killer, a man that resembled Tom, was fleeing the scene. Instead of setting the house alight, he retrieved the murder weapon, the broken mall handle, and disposed of it. He similarly ditched all other items connecting him to the house, but he left his DNA at the crime scene because he had, in fact, happened upon the crime right after it happened. After nearly two weeks of testimony, hearing from 52 witnesses, 12 jurors deliberated for around seven hours and found Michael Beer guilty on all counts of killing Kelly Stage Clayton in her Caton home back in September of last year. And for the prosecution and law enforcement on this case, they say this is just part one of getting justice for Kelly. The top count of first degree murder was applicable if the jury accepted that Michael was hired to commit the murder a fact that would still need to be proven in Tom's trial. After Michael recanted his confession, he could no longer be used as a key witness in the case against Tom. The state needed to show the proof that Michael was hired by Tom in some other way. But no money was ever exchanged. The 10K allegedly promised to Michael had never materialized. No incriminating conversations between the two men were ever overheard. Text message exchanges between the two dealt with work-related topics. Some were notably cryptic, but they did not confirm any agreement to murder Kelly. In that phone call from Linda Miller's phone, Tom claimed to have called Michael offering him some work for the next day helping a player at the poker night move some deer blinds that he purchased. The arrangement and offer for help was confirmed by the other player. Tom's attorneys argued that Michael Beard acted alone. There was no concrete evidence linking Tom to the crime. However, the circumstantial evidence had been stacked against him. The prosecution called an expert witness, Cy Ray, a former police officer who owns a company that uses software to combine data from numerous sources, including phone company records, cell tower information, and GPS data, to track the location and movements of active cell phones at any point in time. Ray used that data to create maps that showed the movements of Thomas Clayton and Michael Beard on specific days leading up to the murder. The data also showed that Michael left his home shortly before 11 p.m. on September 28th, right after he received a phone call from Tom during the poker game. GPS data also tracked Tom to a local business, m and Auto, at about noon on the day leading up to the murder. He stopped in to use the business's phone, saying he was unable to get a signal on his cell. Records obtained from that business line show a call to Michael Beard placed at that time which lasted just over a minute. And security footage from around Michael's apartment building as well as the Serve Pro parking lot began to fill in the gaps. Tom had arranged to switch vehicles the day before the murder with another employee, Luke Tetralt, the same worker that identified the murder weapon. On the Saturday before, Luke showed up at Tom's house in his red pickup truck to collect a four-wheeler for a weekend event. On the Monday, Tom told Luke rather than unloading the four-wheeler from his truck to Tom's, they could just switch trucks for the day and Tom would unload the four-wheeler at home and bring Luke's truck back the next day. Conveniently, security footage at ServPro showed Tom having unloaded the four-wheeler at home dropping off the red pickup truck in the lot at about 6 p.m. and then taking a surf pro truck to drive to the poker game that night. Michael Beard, having left his home after the phone call from Tom, rode a bicycle that Tom had purchased for him to the surf pro lot, collected Luke's red truck, and drove off. Later on, just past 12.30 a.m., after dropping off Mark Branford, security footage again showed a figure dropping the red truck back off at surf pro and exiting on a bicycle. Tom's trial saw 75 witnesses, 400 pieces of evidence submitted by the prosecution, and six full weeks of testimony. It took the jury just six hours to reach a verdict. Tom was convicted of first-degree murder. While Kelly's family rejoiced at the results, Tom's defense team appeared shocked by the decision. They continued to insist that no concrete evidence existed to link Tom to a plot to hire Michael Beard. His lawyer pointed to his polygraph test, which showed he was telling the truth about not being responsible for Kelly's death. Not over. Uh, this is 
Mr. Clayton is, is adamant. Uh, he is not guilty of these offenses. He did not kill his wife. He didn't hire anybody to kill his wife. Appeals for Tom's conviction rested on a few factors. His legal team had argued throughout the trial that the state had not been forthcoming with sharing evidence as they were obligated to do. They further argued that the testimony of Cy Ray, the locations data expert, was inherently flawed. They said that Cy Ray's artificial enhancement of the precision in which cell phones can be located is provably false. It is a phony science. What Cy Ray ended up doing was taking available data that had inherent limitations and repackaging it in a way that made it look as if it was more infallible and more persuasive and more uh, uh, accurate than in fact it was. Court Fourth Department has denied Thomas Clayton's latest appeal for his life sentence for the death of his wife, Kelly Sage Clayton, Chemung County District Attorney Weedon Wentmore, telling AT News that there were no grounds for the appellate court to take up Clayton's latest appeal. Michael Beard similarly fought his conviction, having made a 180 and proclaimed his outright innocence. His appeal was based on the premise that little Charlie's description of the killer having eyes and other traits just like her daddy's clears him, because he is a 6 foot 1, 200 pound African American who looks nothing like Thomas Clayton. The clothing he was wearing that night, however, perfectly matched the description provided by Charlie. Michael's appeal was also unsuccessful. Mark Blanford pleaded guilty to manslaughter for his role as lookout in the murder. In spring 2017, he was sentenced to three to six years. Custody of Charlie and Cullen was given to Kelly's sister, Kim, with whom she had been very close. Kim reported that Charlie stopped talking about what happened that night, a clear sign of how it had traumatized her. Cullen, she said, still cried out for his mother at night, even years after she was lost to him. Thanks once again for joining me today to examine this case. I really appreciate it. I'm Kevin, this is Just Thought Lounge, and I'll see you in the next one.